this evening, as you know, I'm going to be speaking to you about uh, U.S.-China relations and the state of the Sino-American relationship. I need not tell you that this relationship is one of, if not the most important, um, bilateral relationship in the world, not only for the United States and China, but indeed for many, many other countries around the world, and particularly here in the uh, East Asian region. These two, um, what I like to call titans, uh, Professor Soaya just mentioned this edited book that I've uh, published called Tangled Titans, the United States and China. Um, these two titans, major powers, are tangled together in uh, innumerable ways, strategically, diplomatically, economically, socially, culturally, intellectually, environmentally, regionally, educationally, internationally, technologically, you name it. Virtually every realm of our two societies uh, is um, interacting with the other uh, society. <laughs> So these, these two nations are the most uh, powerful here in the East Asian region. They possess the world's two largest economies uh, in aggregate. They have the, two, the world's two largest military budgets now. China, as of last year, has the second largest military budget in the world, $107 billion. Uh, they have the two largest navies in the world. Um, they are the two largest consumers of energy and importers of oil in the world. They are the two largest emitters of greenhouse gases in the world and therefore contributors to climate change. They contribute the two largest numbers of PhDs and patents in the world, which is some indication of intellectual creativity. So by, by these measures, the U.S. and China are inextricably tied together and they exert the greatest impact of any two nations on the planet. Um, and therefore, it's of obvious vital importance that we understand uh, the complexities and the dynamics that underlie this uh, and drive this relationship. Yet, this relationship and these dynamics are in flux, um, and they have changed significantly, I would argue, over the past decade. Um, my main argument uh, tonight uh, is what I see is, and what I see is the as the principal theme today in U.S.-China relations, um, is that is captured in the title of the lecture that the two are inextricably tied together. They cooperate, um, but they uh, compete. So the relationship is a mixture of cooperation and competition. Uh, and if you want to combine that into one word, I call that coopetition. So, um, historically, sometimes, in, particularly in the European case, in the 19th century, major powers can be involved in a kind of concert of powers. And that was the case, of course, in the wake of the uh, Concert of Vienna, the Treaty of Vienna, Concert of Europe. Um, but concerts, I would argue, are inherently fragile um, because they're fluid. And the powers that comprise the concert are, are constantly maneuvering uh, around each other and against each other. And they therefore create uh, mutual uh, security dilemmas. I don't know if you're familiar with the term a security dilemma uh, in political science, but um, that frequently undermines the operation of a concert. It produces uh, strategic suspicions on each side, and as was the case in the Concert of Europe, produces um, war and the disintegration of the, uh, of the concert. So as competition and tensions rise in established power, rising power relations, as they inevitably do, um, they become increasingly acute. Um, as, particularly as the rising powers aggregate power approaches that of the established powers aggregate power. This is called power transition theory. For those of you who haven't been in your political science classes lately, 
actually the father of power transition theory, used to be our professor at the University of Michigan, Professor Organsky. Um, anyway, according to power transition theory, it's not just about uh, rising powers, challenging established powers, and producing conflict. The most the research that's been done in this field finds that the most dangerous point is when the rising powers aggregate power grows near to the established powers aggregate power. That becomes the most uh, risky uh, period because either at that point when the the established power um, feels insecure and frequently will take preemptive action against the rising power to try and repress it and hold it down. Um, or the rising power will take preemptive action against the established power. Another type of great power relations that is sometimes suggested uh, are what is what is known as condominiums of power when the two major powers jointly divide the world and rule the world together and divide the spoils. Uh, that is not, I would argue, an option for U.S.-China relations either. The competitive elements in the U.S.-China relationship, I submit to you, are growing, and the cooperative elements in U.S.-China relations are declining. Uh, over the last five years, five to ten years, um, and the areas of cooperation that do exist, and there are many, are narrowing, whereas the areas of competition between the two countries are broadening. Um, and one finds um, pervasive distrust on both sides of the other. Pervasive American distrust of China, and in China, I can tell you, very pervasive distrust of the United States. Um, there are um, actually, I would argue, very few areas today in U.S. or in, glo in international relations in which you find the United States and China productively cooperating together. And this is, rec this is not a secret. Both sides know it at the very highest levels. And that's why both sides um, have, in the last couple of years, called for what is known as a new type of major power relations. Xin Xing de Da Guo, Guan Xi in Chinese. And that was a term first used by uh, Hu Jintao. Secondly, it was used by uh, the American side by President Obama and Vice President Biden. Thirdly, it was used by uh, Hillary Clinton. Actually, she used it before President Obama did. And then subsequently, uh, new Chinese leader Xi Jinping has called for a, quote, new type of big power relations. And the U.S.-China relationship does not operate in a vacuum. It is very much impacted by these other factors. So the Sino-Japanese relationship is a factor, a big factor, I can tell you, in U.S.-China relations. Um, that is a structural factor. So I would argue, what I'm trying to argue is that the U.S.-China relationship is really considerably out of control of the governments of the two countries, and indeed of the leaders of the two countries. They may wish for the relationship to be cooperative and stable and productive, but these structural factors that are operating in the international, regional, and domestic um, environments, and by the way, political systems are a structural factor in both countries. Um, those structural factors are pushing the relationship in an increasingly competitive direction, I, I find. Okay, so I find that the uh, competitive element has been increasing. Um, the cooperative element has uh, been decreasing. Nonetheless, this is still a very interdependent relationship, extraordinarily interdependent at a variety of, of societal uh, levels. So it's, it's this simultaneous condition, cooperation on the one hand, competition on the other, but interdependence. E even competition is an interdependent concept, right? Um, it's the interdependence that is really driving uh, the relationship. But I think we're in kind of a situation of what I call uh, competitive coexistence uh, between the two today. 
The question is, what are the mechanisms for managing competition? How do you do it? Literally, how do you do it? Um, well, the good news is that the United States and China have a substantial number of bilateral uh, mechanisms and, and dialogues between the two governments, more than 60. There are 60 plus uh, bilateral dialogue mechanisms that meet uh, throughout the year. The two sides disagree about almost everything and that they come to these meetings and the meetings are kind of a facade, kind of a therapy session uh, in which both sides complain to the other about what the other side is doing. So in that, in that sense, it's a good thing. Both sides can kind of evince their frustrations and their discontentments, like going to see a, a therapist. Um, and that helps with understanding what the other side's uh, position is. And understanding the other side's position is the first step to trying to find some common ground. So these, these, mechan these bilateral institutional mechanisms are not unimportant. Um, and they're going to have to be the way that we manage this uh, manage this competition. And it's very important, therefore, that how the United States explains and pursues the rebalancing policy in the second Obama administration. That is to be seen. We're all going to have to wait and see. Um, but if, it, if the Americans uh, pers pursue a, a kind of single dimensional rebalancing, a strategic rebalancing, a military rebalancing, it's going to uh, contribute significantly more to the strategic mistrust and the competitive dynamics. If, on the other hand, the Americans pursue a more comprehensive rebalancing, including economic rebalancing, commercial, uh, sorry, cultural rebalancing, diplomatic rebalancing, um, and a really full reorientation to the Asia-Pacific region, uh, China's angst may be somewhat alleviated. So I think it's critical that the U.S. Um, pursue it comprehensively, allocate the resources comprehensively. Um, manage competition without it moving towards the adversarial end of the spectrum and expand the zone of cooperation. Uh, where possible. Uh, it's not going to be an easy task. Uh, this is, if it can be achieved, it will produce what Kissinger calls in his book, co-evolution. He says the United States and China should aspire to a relationship of co-evolution between the two powers. Um, he says that co-evolution will require, quote, wisdom and patience. Uh, certainly will. It will also require, I would suggest, mutual pragmatism, uh, mutual acceptance and tolerance of each side. And I'm not, it's not clear to me that the respective political cultures and the existing political systems, the national identities, the social values, and the world views of both countries can afford this kind of co-evolution, much less a grand bargain as Kissinger struck with, uh, with Zhou Enlai um, nearly 40 years ago. So, I find these two countries as tangled titans, as I say. Uh, this is the new normal. We have to learn to manage this. And all countries that deal with the United States and China, certainly in the Asia Pacific region, and certainly American allies, um, including Japan, have to think of it in this way. Number one, is to contest Japan's administration of the islands. China has, until recently, or in, until present time, uh, had no administration over the islands, no presence. So what, the first thing I think China is trying to do is to break the monopoly on administration through physical presence, through ships and planes. Second reason is to appease domestic uh, nationalism. This has nothing to do with five islands uh, in the East China Sea. This has to do with history. It has to do with the narrative that the Chinese Communist Party and government has been telling itself and its own people for the last 60 years um, about shame and humiliation uh, as the core narrative of that narrative. Third reason, I would argue, is to probe the US-Japan alliance. 
and to see what the Americans will say. We know what the Americans have said. They're constantly probing to find weakness in America's global position.